Okay. So this is a lecture on arguments in abortion. I am not giving you my opinion about abortion. Uh, that's none of your concern for one, uh, but also I don't want to influence what your own opinion is. Uh, I'm not an authority figure here to try to give you my opinion. Rather, what I'm doing is pointing out some common, um, I don't want to call them fallacies, but some common problems that I've noted in uh, abortion articles that are used over and over in bioethics courses and other ethics courses. So, uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson's The Defense of Abortion, uh, which was published in 71 or 72, uh, ha has been repeat, uh, uh, sorry, reprinted more than any other article that I, I know of. Uh, and I think it's just a very bad article. Uh, and it's not because I disagree with her, uh, with her conclusion, with her position on abortion, because I think it's filled with emotivism. Uh, and I can say the same thing about uh, uh, Noonan's article and the Marquis' article, which is on the pro-life side. Uh, I think there's very many questions that we can ask about them. So what I tried to do in this video is put together some uh, common ideas. And what I found is that many of them revolve around uh, the Aristotelian conception of the soul. And so I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that, but then I'm going to look at some other issues that are involved as well. Uh, those of you who are sitting in front of me can feel free to ask questions at any point. If you have a question about it, then most likely the people who are watching this video are going to have questions about it as well. Okay? Okay, so I want to talk about the uh, rights in uh, discussion of abortion. That's one of the primary ways that we talk about or address abortion uh, in the contemporary era. Uh, this is going to lead to a discussion of what ensoulment is, and I'm going to look particularly at Aristotle and the idea of ensoulment. Uh, then I'm going to talk about why the argument doesn't end uh, by looking at Aristotle. Um, I'm going to look at some characteristics of personhood and some problems that come up with that. Uh, particularly, I'm going to look at the, the analogy between acorns and oak trees, talk a little bit about that one, and then also talk about the analogy with coats and rights. Uh, and again, in all of these, I'm pointing out what I think are some problems with the analogies or the arguments, and I'm not trying to give you my own opinion, uh, pro-life or pro-choice. Uh, I think that trying to answer that question uh, is a uh, problem with the whole debate. There's not a simple answer that's, that is pro-life or pro-choice. Uh, that's as far as I'll go there. So, when we take the rights approach, which is a dominant way of addressing abortion, right? then what we have is a conflict of rights, or at least the way that it's presented in the literature is a conflict of rights, right? It's the rights of the zygote embryo fetus versus the rights of the, the pregnant woman or the mother, okay? Uh, I will slip back and forth between pregnant woman and mother. I don't want to prejudice uh, the discussion by calling the pregnant woman a mother, uh, but that's just the, the way that it happens uh, in the literature and otherwise. So when we talk about the rights of the zygote, embryo, or fetus, the main rights are the right to life and the right not to suffer. Uh, we all recognize both legally and morally a right to life. Okay? And we'll talk about what we mean by the right to life in just a minute, uh, but that's usually an unquestioned right. And we often take it, particularly in our country, as a basic right. Okay? Uh, the right not to suffer uh, may be a little bit more nebulous theoretically, but basically we all think that we should not have to suffer uh, if we don't choose to suffer and if it's not for our, our own good. Okay? The rights on the side of the pregnant woman or the mother is the right to control of one's body, right? And that goes for men and women, uh, but it's particularly historically an important right for women who often lack uh, the control of their own body. Um, and then the secondary right there is, of course, her own right to life. And that comes up when uh, the zygote uh, embryo or fetus uh, can be endangering uh, the right to life of the woman. Okay? Uh, so those are the basic conflicts here when we think about uh, the rights approach. Okay. So if that's the basic conflict, one thing that we might do is think about what do we mean by the term right? Okay? So, uh, typically we can say that a right is a claim to some kind of entitlement. Okay. 
Now, I know in our culture, the idea of entitlement is a, um, a, a hot word that gets people all up in arms because they think that your generation feels like you're entitled to things. Uh, I don't think that's true about your generation, uh, but let's get away from that idea. This is just a common definition, that, that a right is a claim to be entitled to something. Okay? And what the right to, is, is, I'm sorry, what you're entitled to is, is defined by that particular right. Okay. Two general types of rights or two ways of dividing rights is between legal rights and moral rights or between civil rights and human rights. So legal and civil are the same thing, moral and human are the same thing. Okay. So when we talk about legal or civil rights, we're talking about something that really was only in the literature since the late 13th century. And it's the idea that if you live in a particular political entity, a city, a country, right, then you might have rights defined in the city's constitution or the country's constitution or in the laws. Okay. In the United States, we have the Bill of Rights, which lays out uh, 10 different rights. Okay. Moral rights or human rights is again a term that we find only since the late 13th century. And it's the idea that regardless of where you live or under what political entity you live, you have a certain kind of right. Okay? So generally the right to life is considered a moral right, but we also put it into our laws. Okay? So, uh, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, John Locke, I'm oh, sorry, not John Locke, but Thomas Jefferson says we have the right to life, liberty, and property, right? Um, and then we get rights to law, I'm sorry, rights to life in the laws uh, that we have as well. That's typically taken to be based on the moral right to life. So no matter where you are, if you're a refugee, if you are an immigrant, or if you're just traveling to another country, you still have a right to life, even if you're not a citizen of that society. So the broader category, and the one we take to be more important, is the moral or human right. right? This is something we have because we are human beings. And we're going to look at that phraseology in just a minute. Okay? Another way of thinking about rights is positive versus negative. A positive right means that someone is responsible for providing me what I'm entitled to. It's positive in the sense that someone is giving me something and has an obligation to provide that for me. A negative right is a right to be left alone. It's a right of non-interference. Do not interfere. So if we're talking about the right to life, one question we might ask is, is this right to life a right that no one kill me, non-interference, so a negative right, or is it a right that someone support my life? That's a positive right. In the culture of the United States, and most likely in the culture of all liberal democracies, we take the right to education as an unquestioned positive right. The state has an obligation to provide each citizen with a basic level of education. Okay. We take the right to freedom to be a negative right. That doesn't mean it's less important, it just means the way that we look at the right to freedom or the right to liberty is you should not interfere with my choices. Okay. So, no one should prevent or interfere with the exercise of my liberty versus someone owes me something. Questions on those two distinctions? So civil rights or moral rights could be stated in either positive or negative ways. So questions we might ask with relationship to the abortion debate, and sometimes these are asked in the articles and sometimes they are not, is are we talking about a legal right or a moral right? 
Is the right to control one's body a legal right or a moral right? Is it a positive right or a negative right? So a negative right would be no one should interfere with what I want to do with my body. And in fact, Roe v. Wade, Wade is written that way. It goes under the principle, sorry, not the principle, the right to privacy. For those of you who are pro-life, I'm using the right to privacy in a neutral way. I'm not saying that I believe in the right to privacy or that I do not believe in it. That's just the way that it's interpreted through Roe v. Wade. Okay. We can ask the same thing about the fetus, zygote embryo. Um, does the right to life mean that no one should interfere with its life? Or does it mean that there's a, a positive contribution that a person, most likely the mother, has to make to that life? So we might ask questions like, does the pregnant woman have a positive right that someone should help her to attain, uh, obtain an abortion? That's a big political question right now. Uh, can we ask doctors to uh, give an abortion to someone, uh, even if it disagrees with their religious beliefs? And we see this outside of issues about abortion, right? We have the same sort of situation in terms of uh, a couple who wanted a particular cake maker to make them cake, even though the couple disagreed with homosexual marriage and this couple was homosexual, right? So it's a question of who is, has a positive right to get something from someone. When we talk about entitlement there and the way that we do in our culture, it becomes very complicated because we use that term in a very negative way in our culture. Oh, you think somebody should give you something. In many cases, we think of rights in that way. The right to education being such an example. Yes, we think, or at least we have for the last hundred and so years, believe that society should provide an education to every person, or at least every citizen. The other question that comes in here is, does the zygote embryo fetus have a positive right that the pregnant woman support its life? And that would change the discussion a little bit and how we approach the abortion debate, right? So it's not just an issue of the woman has to uh, not interfere with the life of the zygote embryo fetus, but whether the pregnant woman has to do things to maintain the life of that. Right? So we might talk about diet there, we might talk about smoking, we might talk about alcohol and caffeine intake. Um, I want to turn then for a couple of minutes onto the right of uh, the uh, life of the fetus in focus, but I have a question first. Um, for the last thing you talked about on this slide, the positive and negative right to abortion, um, about how does the zygote embryo fetus have positive right to pregnant women's sports life, does that only mean inside of the woman, or does it mean like afterwards as well, like if the mother has like the means to take care of the child to give it a life? So, because we're talking about the abortion debate, we're just talking about inside of the, the pregnant woman. Okay. Outside, then, it becomes a different kind of issue, okay. uh, which Thompson sort of admits at the end of her article, and then uh, when you read the Warren article, where she lists the five characteristics of a person, and she talks about infanticide at the end of that article, it becomes an issue there as well. Okay. Okay? Thank you. Other questions on pause? Okay. Thank you. Great question. Okay, so when we talk about the right to life, typically we focus on the zygote embryo or fetus, right? Uh, so what's the difference between these two cat three cat categories? Well, a zygote is basically the single cell organism that appears with the union of the sperm and the ovum, right? So uh, before that period, we have two cells, each having uh, 23 chromosomes, when they come together and merge, then we have one cell with 46 chromosomes. That's a biologically significant difference, right? And one of the articles talks, one of the articles talk about 
uh, the change in uh, percentages of uh, survival after that point. Okay, and that's important to keep in mind. Okay, uh, this is uh, so the single cell organism is a zygote until the very cell first uh, cell cleavage. Right, it is an embryo then uh, as a multicellular organism from that first cleavage until um, about eight weeks. Okay, and here this is a period of very rapid uh, change and growth. Uh, in the uh, individual organism, okay? And this is, the eight week period is true for human beings, but the embryo stage is uh, for any mammal, okay? Um, the fetus then is the unborn mammalian offspring uh, after that eight week period. There's still lots of development and growth uh, but we, but there's a bit of slowdown here, and uh, we tend to, to recognize the form of the organism as uh, similar in many ways to the form of an adult of its species. Okay. In other words, it looks a little bit like a human being now, whereas in the embryonic stage, it doesn't look like a human being. Biologically speaking then, if we're speaking of the union of the sperm of a homo sapiens and the ova of a homo sapiens, then the resulting zygote embryo fetus is homo sapiens, or colloquially what we call human. I think we could do ourselves a lot of good if we use the biological terms to help point this out, but also if we stop using the term human, which is an adjective, as a noun. Right? Uh, we are human beings, uh, and we're the kind of beings that are human. Right? Now that might be the Aristotle in me, uh, but I think it's more clear uh, in our writings if we use the full term human beings when we're talking about an actual member of the species Homo sapiens. Okay. So that's biology right there. Any questions about that, particularly from my biology students? I didn't say anything stupid or wrong. I haven't had it work, so. So it raises the question, what do we mean by human? If we say that every human has a right to life, what does that phrase mean? So here we have a common argument, or the way that the argument is commonly put. Every human has a right to life. Abortion kills a human, therefore abortion violates the right to life. Now, this is a deductive argument, but it has a problem in terms of equivocation. Right. So equivocation is when we use the same looking term in two different ways to mean two different things. Right. So when we put the argument in this way, in one sentence, human means human being and most likely means person. Whereas in the second sentence, it's not clear that we're talking about a human being or at least whether we're talking about a person. Now, I've already said that we're talking about a homo sapiens and that homo sapiens are human beings. But when we start to say that human beings and persons are equivocal, which is bad logic, right, then it raises the question about whether we're really talking about a human being, a person here. Okay? So I think a lot of the debate about abortion, particularly in the first 2,000 years, has been an issue about equivocation, okay? So traditionally, when we think about a person, the term is much broader and includes things that are not human beings. God is a person, or actually, uh, in the Christian religion, God is three persons in one, okay? Uh, angels are also included as persons. So if we change the argument, every person has a right to life, Abortion, abortion kills a person, then we begin to stop. Does it really kill a person, or does it, does it kill a member of Homo sapiens? Right? And so then we have to have further arguments that says that any member of Homo sapiens is a person. And so one of the popular articles about that is the one by Warren that I mentioned before that lists five characteristics of persons. I'm not really going to address that article very much uh, because I'm talking about uh, other issues at this point. Questions? 
So, in our culture, that is Western European American culture, we like to talk about persons in terms of souls. Right? And this becomes problematic because in our culture based on Greek philosophy, we have two different understandings of the word soul. And when we throw religion into it, we actually have three different understandings of the word soul. Okay. So those of you familiar with Plato and Socrates, they talk about soul as something that leaves the body and exists by itself. Uh, perhaps you've also heard of Descartes who uses the same kind of language. He'll talk about the mind as a separate substance from the body. A separate tradition is that which goes with Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas and the Catholic Church, which says that the soul is not something separate from the body, but something that is one part with the body that makes a whole unit. So you can't have soul separate from the body if you're Aristotle or Thomas. Okay? Historically, Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas have said that ensoulment happens at 40 days for the male and 80 days for the female. Sorry, ladies. Um, now, that's based on Aristotle's biology. And we know that Aristotle's biology was wrong, and we can go into why he was wrong and that sort of stuff. Um, but it also has to do with when the uh, fetus first moves, or the woman first feels the fetus move uh, in her womb. And that's around 40 days. I don't know where they came up with the 80 days. Um, so when we put that together, right, with the issue of soul, and we get differences between uh, Protestant and, and uh, sorry, Protestant and Catholic, or Platonic versus Aristotelian, things can get even more confusing. This is clear when we look at the case of immortality. St. Paul says in uh, one of his letters, I think it's the letters to the Romans, could be the letters to the Corinthians, that it is a resurrection of the body. That's the term that he uses. So under a, uh, we might say, correct reading of St. Paul and of the Catholic Church, we don't have souls that are resurrected. We have bodies that are resurrected. We become back, right? I'm going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Um, in the Protestant tradition, oftentimes it's not taught that way. It's talked about a resurrection of the soul, okay? And that complicates things uh, because then we have to figure out what we mean by soul. Okay, so here's how an Aristotelian like myself thinks about soul. The fancy terminology is it's the organizing principle of the living body. The organizing principle of the living body. What the heck does that mean? This is what it means. If we took all the chemicals in the human body and we put it in a bucket, we would not call it a human being, a member of Homo sapiens, or a person. And the reason is because those chemicals versus the chemicals in my body are organized differently. So whatever it is that makes all the chemicals in my body and your body act and look and think like a human being, that is the soul. From Aristotle, it's a very, in many ways, materialistic basis without be becoming simple materialism. So simple materialism, you see that in a lot of biology today, uh, uh, particularly with um, E.O. Wilson uh, and, uh, shoot, I can't think of the guy right now, Richard Dawkins, thank you, um, who see the body as simply determined material. And everything that we do, except even the next words that I speak, are all determined from the beginning of history. Aristotelian materialism is much more holistic and says there's something more than just chemicals here. Right? 
And we, if we were in a class on what is a human person, we could get into some discussion about what that might be. The basic idea, though, is that anything that is living has a soul. Plants have a soul. My cat Snowflake has a soul. Dogs have a soul. Squirrels have a soul. Because what the soul is, is the way that a living body is organized. And it can be organized along three different patterns. As a vegetable thing, as an animal thing, a non-rational animal thing, and as a rational animal thing. So you and I, presumably, are rational animal things. It's pretty obvious that we're animals. We eat, we go to the bathroom, right? But we're also rational. I'm speaking right now, and you can understand the words I'm saying, and you can argue with me if you wanted to. Okay? The question that Aristotle and Thomas had was, when does the soul of the fetus become human? And they took movement as a clear sign because vegetables only have nutrition, whereas animals have a sensory, appetitive, and locomotive capacity. We can't tell when it has a mind, but we can tell when it's moving. And so if it's not moving, it can't be an animal, so it can't be rational. So they picked movement as a sign that at least it's an animal and probably a rational animal. That was Aristotle and Thomas Aquinas basically using their own principles incorrectly. Okay. There's a question in this debate about whether you and I have three souls, one for our nutrition, one for our movement, and one for our rationality, or whether we have one soul that has all of those powers. And Thomas Aquinas actually says we have one soul that has all of those powers. And he doesn't follow that through on uh, the abortion debate. So that's one problem with Thomas's abortion debate. Right? So for Thomas Aquinas, abortion was uh, morally OK. It wasn't murder until 40 days for a male, 80 for a woman. So there's some bad biology going on. There's some bad application of their own principles going on. Um, and there's a debate about you know, what are we talk, really talking about when we're identifying a soul as having all of these different powers. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to say that I have three souls. I have one soul that has all of these different powers. Okay? And uh, when I die, that one soul goes away. It's not like two souls stay around. And that can become important if we start talking about end-of-life issues with euthanasia. Okay. This is complicated, so any questions about this? So from the Aristotelian point of view, we're not talking about something that lives separately from the body or exists separately from the body. We're talking about something that's integral to the body, and the body is integral to it. So there's a debate, just to go back to the immortality issue real quick, where uh, Thomas Aquinas is talking about immortality, and he says, well, the soul lives in an unnatural state until resurrection, between death and resurrection. Again, that's Thomas Aquinas being bad about his own principles. If Thomas Aquinas is being consistent, the soul cannot exist even unnaturally. Um, to exist unnaturally is a contradiction in terms. Um, so for us, if we believe in resurrection of the body, resurrection for us is going to be immediate. That doesn't mean I'm coming back immediately after I die. It means that wherever heaven is, if there's a where, and if there's physical bodies, there has to be a where, right? Between death and then is immediate for me. Okay? That's complicated metaphysics, don't get lost on that in the rest of the debate. All right. So if we're asking from an Aristotelian point of view about abortion and ensoulment, then we have to ask the question, when is this body organized as the body of a homo sapiens? The sperm and the ova are not organized as bodies of homo sapiens because they do not have a full complement of chromosomes. 
The zygote is organized as the body of a homo sapiens. It has the full complement of chromosomes. Now when I say that, I do not mean to equivocate soul and chromosomes. I'm saying here's an identifiable difference between these two types of bodies. And we know that this type of body, the one with 43, or, sorry, 46 chromosomes, when it is an adult, is going to be called homo sapiens. So here it's also homo sapiens because it has the same physical kind of chemical makeup. So the scientific answer is, what's the human genetic code? And that's pretty obvious, right? Now we might talk about rationality, but when we start talking about rationality in, in a way that separates the zygote and the embryo and the fetus from the adult human being, then we're talking about rationality as like a switch that we turn on at some point. That's a poor way to think about it because the way that our, our, we are rational animals organizes our whole development. The brain develops as a brain that's capable of rational thinking. The spinal column develops as a spinal column of a thinking being. It doesn't begin to develop as the spinal column of a fish, even though it looks like a fish when it's three weeks old. It develops as the spinal column of a rational being, or a rational animal. We know this because an unconscious human being is still a rational human being, even though that person is not thinking at that point. So the rational soul organizes the body of the homo, of the, the, the homo sapiens. So if we looked at the abortion debate from the issue of insolment, and we take the Aristotelian position, we know when the being is a member of homo sapiens. And that's our best guess as to when it's a, a person, because it's a rational animal by definition. If we look at it from the perspective of a Protestant or a Platonist or a, a Cartesian, there's no way to know biologically when it is a uh, rational animal. Right? Because we can't tell when the soul goes into the, for Descartes it sits in the pineal gland, right? Uh, we don't know when that happens. That doesn't, like, and we know that we don't know when that happens because he denied that the squirrels, for instance, were living beings. He thought they were automatons. He thought they were robots. Okay. Does the Aristotelian position end the argument? I would say no for a couple of reasons. First off, the right to life is not absolute. So we can get into conversations about when and what are the limits to the right to life. So if the mother's life is threatened, then we have self-defense as a, uh, a reason for abortion. Okay. The church, the Catholic church, when I say the church, I mean that. The Catholic church will use what's called the principle of double effect, and you can look that up if you'd like, to argue that in a situation like that, then as long as the abortion is procured to save the life of the mother and not to end the life of the fetus, it would be morally correct. Uh, we also might say that the right to life can be limited if it's a case of rape. Uh, overwhelmingly, a majority of adults say that in cases of rape, abortion should be legalized. Now, I said legalized there on purpose because I don't know if we would say the same thing about being morally right, although I think a majority, when I say a, an overwhelming majority, I'm talking like 80% or more, right? Would we'll say in those cases, it would be morally right. That raises the question of whether we believe rights are absolute or not. Okay? Typically, we talk about the right to life, life as an absolute right. I think most of our culture does not treat it that way. The death, be, death penalty being a prime example. We also have a conflict of rights here, even if the fetus does have a right to life. Because there's the right of the woman to control her body. Finally, 
from an Aristotelian to mystic perspective, we also have the issue that we might be living in what we would call a corrupt culture. Right? A culture that so easily commodifies living beings and sells them for uh, sex purposes. A culture in which uh, women are not given rights to choose how they use their body. We might call these corrupt cultures, in which case moral principles and moral arguments become quite different. And in some spaces in his discussion of natural law, Thomas Aquinas says that a, corrupt, a culture could be so corrupt that an evil act would not be, uh, the person would not be responsible for that evil, or, I'm sorry, culpable for that evil act. So it wouldn't count as a sin. Now I'm not saying that abortion is a sin, and I'm not saying that it's wrong. I'm saying that if we look at the culture more broadly, we have to think about where abortion fits into our culture. Right? and how our culture treats women. A significant fact about that is that we live in a rape culture. One in three women are going to be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. Right? That's a terrifying statistic, and I'm not even a woman. Right? Uh, so when we have that kind of culture, the questions about abortion become secondary because there's something wrong with the way that we organized our culture. So there's all kinds of reasons why this Aristotelian approach does not answer the question about abortion right now. I want to move on to some other issues, though. So I've talked about the issue of having other characteristics of personhood. And uh, Warren lists five, re uh, five characteristics. Consciousness or the ability to feel pain. That's not as helpful as we would like to be because the fetus can feel pain between 18 and 26 weeks of gestation. Okay. We know the biology behind pain, and we can look at that. Reasoning, the ability to solve new and complex problems. On some of my worst days, I don't know if I have reasoning capacity. Right? Uh, but when does a child or an infant gain that reasoning capacity? Self-motivated activity. Uh, when you're drunk, are you self-motivated? A, capac a capacity to communicate messages of an indefinite variety. And when I typed this up, I was thinking about that old uh, idea that if I put a thousand monkeys in a room and have them give them all typewriters, they could write the Iliad or something, right? Um, just statistically speaking. <clears throat> and then presence of self-concepts and self-awareness. The human infant does not achieve this kind of presence using the mirror test until uh, 20 to 24 months. Warren does address this issue because her argument does justify infanticide. Uh, and we obviously don't recognize infanticide as morally right. And she tries to get out of that sort of question. My point for bringing this up is if we use something other than biology to address the question of insolvent or personhood, we get into very complicated issues that allow the justification of infanticide up to about 12 years of age. Up until that point, our, brain, our brains are very classic. So that if you lose half of your brain, you can still develop capacities in the other half that you lost. After 12 years of age, plasticity reduces very greatly. Right? So we know of persons who lost, um, is it the Broca's area that's responsible for language? Did I get that right? Uh, whichever area is responsible for language, you know the people who have lost that area and they've developed it in the other side of the brain, before the age of 12 and not after. Ah, so brain plasticity, very important. Okay. Another issue that comes up here, and one that's often used in popular debate and that uh, Judith Jarvis Thompson uses, is she says the acorn and the oak tree are not the same thing. And I'm often confused about what she means by that. If I plant this acorn, then the oak tree into which it grows is the same thing. We just have different names for the stages. So the seed is the acorn. This is the sap, uh, sap, sapling, right, the small tree. And then this is the oak tree. 
But all three of these things have the same genetic code. So they are going to be the same thing. So the appropriate comparison here is developmental stages of the human being. And we just have more developmental stages because we have a more complicated genetic code. So our zygote is like the acorn. And when we start to develop into the embryo and the baby, we're like the tree sapling. And when I look like this, I'm like the oak tree. Okay? I should have said Vin Diesel before instead of Arnold, but you know. So this brings to mind that when we talk about analogies, we have to be careful about what we're trying to make the analogy and why we're trying to make it. And again, I'm not trying to take a position on abortion. What I'm trying to say is that common arguments in the, in the literature are simply poor arguments. And you can tell this is a poor argument in, in, in uh, Thompson because she says, well, it's obvious that the acorn is not the oak tree. Anytime a philosopher of any bent says it's obvious, are surely, first say, don't say surely, but any time a philosopher says that, they don't have any grounds to base their argument on. They've reduced their argument to an emotivist appeal. Okay? And uh, you can watch my other video about emotivism to understand that. <clears throat> Another poor argument, if Jones is found and fastened on a certain coat, which he, keeps, uh, which he needs to keep from freezing, but which Smith also needs to keep him from freezing, then it is not impartiality that says, I cannot choose between you when Smith owns the coat. Women have said again and again, this is my body. <clears throat> and they have reason to feel angry, reason to feel that it has been like shining into the wind. So here we have an analogy between owning a coat and owning my body. So one question we can ask is, is that the same thing? Because I can take my coat off and I can trade it and I can sell it and my coat wears out and I'll give it to Goodwill, right? But I wouldn't give my body to Goodwill if it like degraded. Well, maybe I would, no. <laughs> Thompson's argument, and a lot of these arguments are based on the idea of private property, which goes all the way back to the origins of capitalism and John Locke and goes into a lot of different kinds of conversations. But I think we need to be wary about the way that we talk about owning our bodies as a form of property. I think there's something much more intimate to that, right? If I give you my coat, I'm not having sex with you. If I give you my body, presumably I am, right? <clears throat> Further, she says, if you own the coat, it's not impartial for me to say that I'm, I'm choosing between the two of you. I cannot choose between the two of you. That depends on our own understanding of coats. If there's only one coat to be had, and that's the only way to stop one of you from freezing, we're not really in a situation where morality can make a choice because we're in a situation where desperation is the choice. And the real question becomes, how do I find a way to keep all of us warm? And this might be a place for a supererogatory act where I give one of you my coat and I'm the one that freezes to death. So, her analysis here reduces a very complicated situation to a simple thing which isn't as simple as it seems. Uh, and just to bring in Thomas Aquinas again, <clears throat> he argues that if someone is in need of something, then rights to property don't matter. If that person has a need, they have to be fulfilled. In this case, what we have is two people who need the same thing. And that complicates the issue, and that's where supererogatory obligations come in, or where we end up in war. I have a question. Yes? I don't understand the power of the power. Uh, In a fight, the rich man tries to save his face, the poor man his coat. Um, well, I think the person who uh, wrote this proverb is trying to say that the, the rich person, uh, if he's fighting with a poor person, He's not really fighting over the coat, he's right, fighting over his, what he thinks of as his respect. Whereas a poor person only wants to have his coat. So what is that, like, how does that relate to? It's a, it's a, um, 
Sorry, I didn't think it was going to be confusing. Um, it's a way to say that the questions about property are not as easy as they seem. Okay, I'm not trying to say that there's one right way or one wrong way in here. I'm just saying it's a complicated issue. Sorry. All right, so in this video, I've given a discussion of rights, discussion of insolment. The argument doesn't end with the discussion of insolment, and then I've pointed out some other complications in the argument that are common. Uh, I don't think that I favored one side or the other in the argument. What I'm really trying to do is point out some common problems with the argument and trying to get us on a footing where we can address the issues a little more clearly. So thank you very much.